Increasing numbers of black Americans have achieved great levels of personal and financial success. Relationships with God, parental influences, renewed ideas about personal responsibility, and focused educational achievements have created a new generation of middle-class blacks. Who are these individuals and how were they influenced as children to become successful adults? This is their story. So your parents had a lot of control in terms of who you interacted with. Oh, my the parents, that you, extreme yeah. control. Mm -hmm. And even in her interacting with other children, I could go to whoever's house, come home, and I'm grilled. Mm -hmm. What does their house look like? What size really? is it? How is it furnished? What kind of car do they drive? What do they do? How much money do they make, do you mm -hmm. think? Mm -hmm. And how on a scale of 1 to 10, how do they compare to us? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much of keeping up with the Joneses because they were the Joneses. seven, mm -hmm. uh, five girls, two boys. My mother and father divorced when we were five years old, mm -hmm. well actually when I was five, and uh, so she was the sole breadwinner and uh, she actually worked two jobs uh, to mm -hmm. try and make ends meet. My father was kind of distant and, mm -hmm. uh, and didn't participate in the financial upbringing of the children, mm -hmm. uh, which was very tough on her. Yeah. And, um, and her role was uh, she worked at uh, grade school as a custodian and, mm -hmm. and then also she had part-time job at another school where mm -hmm. she actually did also cleaning. Mm -hmm. So that's where we come from. That's great. So she was working two jobs and, and just working her hind off. Oh yeah. On behalf of seven, seven children. Seven children. And so tell me how does that how does that impact you now? When you look at her example, her model and to see where you are today. Well she motivates me. I mean she's my strength. Mm -hmm. And she really motivates me because not only um, after the divorce, because she act we're actually Jamaican, mm -hmm. she actually moved to Canada mm -hmm. and then individually sponsored every child over really? and on a custodian salary. Mm -hmm. So that's impressive yes. as a single black woman. Mm -hmm. And um, that drives me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't initially mm -hmm. because at the age of 14, 16, of course, I became the rebellious child and go to mm -hmm. school, you know, party yes. with the friends. and. Uh, you know, she tried to instill education is important, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, that wasn't important to me at mm -hmm. the time, and I didn't see the benefit. Mm -hmm. And I think the changing point for me was one evening, on Thursday evening, she came in really exhausted, and it was about 11:30 at night, and she just kind of slumped herself on the couch. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, my girlfriend and I were partying and in the kitchen, and I came in and I said, "Why do you do that to yourself?" And she turned to me and said, "Because I have to." I don't mm. have a career, I have jobs, mm. and I have to support the family. That's what I have to do to support you guys. And you know, at that moment, that's when I realized, what am I doing? You yeah. know, here I'm afforded an opportunity to go to school mm -hmm. and advance myself so I don't have to struggle like mm -hmm. she has. And, and that's what actually changed for me. Mm -hmm. and, and then education became a very strong focus in my mm -hmm. life, and to the point where I think I probably overeducated myself. Oh really? Uh, you know, uh, I got a hotel degree, I got a CPA, and mm -hmm. I'm always looking forward to always improve myself, mm -hmm. also educationally, professionally, as well as just personally. Yes. And and I think that's important. Absolutely important. So that point in time, that one incident is in your mind to this. It day. always is, and uh, it just marks that point for me where life changed, mm -hmm. and. Had it not, I would have probably ended up down a different path where most mm -hmm. of my other friends ended up uh, because they didn't have a defining moment. I came from a mother who was um, mentally ill, manic depressive, mm -hmm. and um, who had a weight problem, and a father who was in and out of prison. Mm -hmm. um, I was, when she had me, she was unable to take care of me, so I was in a Brangman's nursery home in Bermuda mm -hmm. until I was two. I had an aunt, a great aunt, who, um, her name's Mary Brewster, mm -hmm. and she would come and visit me 
on um, weekends and she would take me with her to her house and she said when I was two she went to drop me off and she would, used to uh, tell me that all the time like my nose was running and nobody would wipe it and, and um, the different things um, and one day uh, she went and what happened is she turned back and when she looked into my eyes peering out of the window at her um, she couldn't do it. She couldn't sure. leave me there. Mm -hmm. Even though it was a good establishment and Miss mm -hmm. Brangman did a wonderful job, she uh, felt in her heart that she needed to take me. And um, she talked, um, a year later my mother had my sister and she talked to my grandfather about taking her. Mm -hmm. So she raised me and she raised me as her own. I think that was my first step of opportunity. Um, I don't know what I would have been in, mm -hmm. uh, what state I would have been in had she not taken a chance on me. Uh, my father is, well, both my parents are from down south, mm -hmm. even though we were both, we were, all of us were raised in Chicago, mm -hmm. but raised with southern roots, mm -hmm. uh, deeply, you can do it yourself, you need to be able to be accountable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm one of three, all of us are boys, so it's the household was just a very male environment mm -hmm. where you had a lot of do for selfism. Mm -hmm. Where you, you know, that's a new word. Do for selfism. Like <laughs> where you Make know, sure we get, keep that on tape. I mean, I had, I had my brothers definitely as out as, as resources on how to mm -hmm. do things, but even them, they might tell you how to do something, but they wouldn't do it for you. Mm -hmm. You go out there, you do it. Don't come to me when you have the ability to do it yourself. So that's what even now, that you know, there's things that I can do. I know I can do it, and so I'm going to go out there. And then you can't tell me I can't do it when I know I can. And if mm -hmm. there's something I don't know, I'll look it up. I'll find out how to do it. And then I'm going to go for it. I um, was born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, my mother was a teacher. My father was a banker. And I have a younger brother. And around nine, we moved to Teaneck, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And there I've been till I went to college. Okay, so kind of a middle class kind of background? Yeah, well, Georgia right. City was uh, urban, and then mm -hmm. we moved to Teaneck that was more suburban. Okay. Now, how did that change from moving from an urban environment to a sub suburban environment impact you? Um, it was probably the first major drastic change of my life in terms of just surroundings. Um, Jersey City was primarily African American where mm -hmm. I grew up and Teaneck was like a big melting pot of diversity so mm -hmm. it was definitely a transition that I'm glad that I had at nine mm -hmm. as opposed to older than that. Why? Um, because I think that it took a lot of time to get used to uh, just in terms of you know being young and being exposed to different things and I think that that was actually a really good foundation and it able, enabled me to be where I am today. Mm -hmm. um, just being in high school which was a critical point in my life um, I was able to be exposed to things that I don't think that I would have been if I would have stayed in Jersey City. Mm -hmm. Things that are positive. Oh absolutely. Like what? Well um, I got exposed to the quality of the education was very different. I got exposed to having different types of people in classes. It was a bit more of a competitive nature, a bit more drive to succeed, I would say, in some in certain cases. Mm -hmm. So that kind of sparked a little bit of a competitive nature in me in terms of academia. My childhood was pretty much, it was two worlds, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. um, of my mother's seven brothers, you've got neurologists, you've got a Harvard graduate, mm -hmm. you've got professors and um, and my other uncle he's an entrepreneur so he's only worked two days I mean two years for someone else and has worked for himself ever since mm -hmm. um, however my immediate family um, for the bulk of my life I was raised by a single mother but mm -hmm. my but my parents together uh, pretty much my class wise we grew up poor mm -hmm. and it was because my mother did go to college but because of her getting married while she was in school, then becoming pregnant, mm -hmm. and my father really not stepping up to his responsibilities mm -hmm. um, as a caregiver for my sister. Mm -hmm. um, she ended up having to drop out of school instead mm -hmm. of becoming a doctor. Mm -hmm. So so I got the best of, I guess, both sides of it. Growing up, both my parents are corporate executives. Um, they were you know, valedictorians, put themselves through college, relatively came from, my mother was from a middle class family, mm -hmm. well, blue collar family. Mm -hmm. My father was um, more, I guess, higher end in terms of economics. His mother was married to an Italian man. Mm -hmm. 
in Chicago, mm -hmm. enough said. Mm -hmm. um, so they had a different lifestyle um, in growing up. They were very smart, very, very intelligent, driven. Both of them, just a point of reference, are both Scorpios. Mm -hmm. And in their union decided that they were gonna achieve, and obviously failure was not an option. Mm -hmm. And um, I, being a Scorpio too, planned Scorpio, um, they instilled in me unique traits and they were very clear on cultivating who their child was. So what are those traits that they instilled in you? Well, those traits included, well, it was more so being clear on who their child was mm -hmm. by knowing themselves. And it was, you're gonna be good in mathematics. You're mm -hmm. gonna defy authority. And really recognizing that and being prepared to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And also making me aware of who I was. Mm -hmm. But there are no ifs, ands, or buts about it that I am gonna defy authority. Doesn't mean it won't be a problem, just you will. Mm -hmm. They were very specific mm -hmm. on and you know creating the Ron and Julia product. Mm -hmm. What um, my mother did wrong initially mm -hmm. is because she tried to overprotect us so much. There was five girls, and her fear was, "Don't get pregnant like I did," yeah. and and have to struggle. Mm -hmm. And so she tried to just hold you down so tightly that everyone was trying to break out. Mm -hmm. And I think as parents, you need to let your kids be free and explore life, and give them just like you do when they're little babies. You let mm -hmm. them explore, and you let them run through it. Mm -hmm. You know, the house. Yes. That's how they learn. Mm -hmm. And when they make a mistake, or if they come to you, that's when you you know. You give them the advice, but you also provide the guidance uh, just in the way you behave so mm -hmm. that they can learn from that. Yes. And, and that's what I would say to parents is just, you know, let your, your child be an individual mm -hmm. because it's not just book smarts. You need the street smarts too. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's a little package. The recommendation that I would give to parents is, for one, make sure that you explain to your child or show or demonstrate for your child responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother definitely instilled in us that she used to care for us. We, we never had to watch, I never had to watch my younger sisters or change their diapers or do anything like that because she wanted us to understand that a child is your responsibility. You're to care for them. They come first. Um, she never purchased things for herself. She always did for us. If she couldn't, she couldn't necessarily drive us to school, but she would walk us to school every day. She would get up and wait with us at the bus stop, whatever it was that she had to do. She made sure that we understood that she loved us and that she supported us. Yeah. It's a twofold position. I believe that my parents were extremely difficult, hard on me mm -hmm. and had zero tolerance. Mm -hmm. But I was raised in a zero tolerance life. So you can't change and go from you know, complete tolerance to zero tolerance. Mm -hmm. So it was expected and I'd weighed the pros and the cons. So I think that you should be supportive but still stay on them because when you slack off is when they say, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about it. I had to earn my place again in mm -hmm. the family. I had to earn, as my father would say, I had to earn my inheritance because any time I misbehaved and the threat was to be pulled out of the will, mm -hmm. it was making sure that the children that I interacted with were of our same socioeconomic peers mm -hmm. under the belief that those within same socioeconomics have the same expectation and criteria for their children. So they were basically placing you in an environment they thought would bring more success to you, or at least wouldn't have you going in the other direction. Right. So how does that make you feel, and, and how does that manifest itself in, in you now? Because you're a mature lady, and, and you make decisions for yourself, so how does that impact you? Well, we're, we are truly a family of the collective. Mm -hmm. I don't make decisions for myself. Mm -hmm. We are a belief in the success of the unit mm -hmm. and my success is their success their success will trickle down to my success I think that one of the reasons for moving and, and getting myself and my brother into a different environment was the fact that my parents recognized the need for a little bit um, more of a push in terms of academics um, mm -hmm. my mother being a teacher she was very focused on ensuring that academically we were well prepared mm -hmm. um, she recognized uh, the lack 
of concentration in the urban school systems in terms of really pushing and developing and selling children. So that, you know, pushed her and my father to seek a better place for myself and my brother to develop and grow. I think it was absolutely the best decision that they made. And education was always key. You, you knew you were going to college. It was never a question of paying for it because you knew you were getting a scholarship. So mm -hmm. I think the combination of the love and the importance, the significance of education was, was vital, was crucial. So what did she do to make sure that you got the A's and got the scholarship? And what did you do? Part of it had to be some self-motivation. Don't tell me um, you cheated. No, 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 no. My mother made sure that we were plugged into our uncles. Mm -hmm. um, we actually did algebra contests at family functions. We read, she read constantly, so we always read. Um, so at, at the, at the um, family <laughs> reunion, you guys did the, algebra contests? The family barbecue, it didn't have to be a reunion, it'd just be whatever holiday. Mm -hmm. All the cousins and everybody, we would get together and we would do algebra competitions. Mm -hmm. Or um, my uncles would ask us questions and we would get monetary prizes for our answers and things like that. So And that was motivating for you guys? We thought it was normal. Mm -hmm. And even when we got A's, right. if we got a B, the question was, or it was never a matter of, congratulations on these A's, it was always, so why'd you get this B? What are you gonna do next time to not get this B? Mm -hmm. And whereas she was not stringent in that, she was not the one to, I guess, um, highlight any things that you did wrong. She mm -hmm. always gave us support and congratulated us on the things that we did, um, that we did well, but she made sure that we had other people in our lives, um, our uncles, to make sure that we had that that balance and that, um, I guess, discipline. Mm -hmm. So because we were raised in a fashion where we didn't think college was an option, I don't think we really understood that there was a choice mm -hmm. until we graduated from okay. school or while we were in school. So mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, that's pretty much how that came about. Speaking My Aunt Mary was very entrepreneur in mind. I grew up um, in her store uh, playing with the cash register mm -hmm. and having a strong sense of money. Um, she paid everything in full, in cash. Mm -hmm. So I learned early about uh, not carrying a lot of debt. Okay. Um, she was interested in anything educational, and so were her children, and so they raised me as such. Church is the, the backdrop of everything. I mean, I, I mean in, in my decisions, I, I guess, in my decisions, I can stray from what I've learned but then I always come back to it. And in church, I learned discipline as well. I grew up in the church. My, before my father was a minister, he was a musician. Mm -hmm. So we were all in the choir. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about choir rehearsals where you learn discipline. Everybody might not be able to sing, but you're gonna sing at the same time. You're gonna to rock together. You're mm -hmm. gonna to clap at the same time. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna chew gum. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be awake. When he became a That's minister- because you know most folks in the choir can't sing. <laughs> But even in church, might I mean, have two or three people that can sing. Exactly, mm -hmm. but, but you, you look good. Oh, well, mm -hmm. I, I come from musical family, so we yes. could sing. You, could, so, yeah, you were the ones that could sing. Then. So then we had to be on the right note, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we had to carry people. As a black male growing up, and then finally getting to like the college environment, and listening to a lot of the issues as we as African Americans face, you'll have a, a group that says, "Well, we need to." We need to make sure that we have things like affirmative actions, mm -hmm. and things like that to make sure that we can get to a level playing field. And I definitely understand and relate to that because I spent a portion of my life on the south side of Chicago, mm -hmm. and then we moved to the suburbs into an all white environment, mm -hmm. in which I can, and, but we still had church in the city, mm -hmm. we still had family in the city, so I could see the differences on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. So I definitely agree with that. But then I also, as I got older and get into the corporate environment, I understand that you can't point the finger at everybody else and say it's your fault that I didn't get this, mm -hmm. it's your fault that I didn't get that. And that also plays in the fact of well, the upbringing that I had in which the saying, well look, you can say, well, my lack of education came from this area, but then you can also say, well, I recognize that, I understand that, that's where I'm at, I gotta bust my end. Mm -hmm. And then, but also I'm gonna say, well, I did it, but that doesn't mean everybody could do what I did. I have the responsibility to go back and make it better for other people. And so it's changed as I got older that everything is not somebody else's problems. I mean, before I was, I, I used to be a lot of uh, 
I guess, a mini activist, mm -hmm. righting the wrongs that people yeah. do to you and spending a lot of time in that area. But then after a while, it's like everybody's just whining about something. Yeah. So now you know personal responsibility means something. Exactly. Um, a strong sense of God. I think that um, understanding your creator and your purpose is going to help you when you go through your rough period. I really believe that there is nothing within reason that mm -hmm. I, I can't do if I focus and I try hard enough. And that's kind of like what they instilled in me, to just not stop. Even when I hit a crossroad, even when I hit, you know, rock bottom in my mind, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel and you just work for that. So tell me, how do you handle those moments when you do feel your rock bottom? Oh, they're rough. <laughs> but um, I always still believe that there's a way out of something or there's a way around something or there's still a way to succeed at something. Mm -hmm. So even when something, you know, not too pleasant occurs, I still really focus and just try to work something out and make sure that something works overall. So you focus when those situations occur. Mm -hmm. And I identify the goal, identify mm -hmm. where I want to be. And I also kind of look back to see if and when where I did something wrong. And I'll to not do it again, obviously, mm -hmm. but... Um, so you, do, you look inward as well. To, absolutely. To you can learn a lot from okay. yourself, especially in a, in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. You can always look back to see what can I do better. Nine times out of ten, if you do that, you won't do it again. How does that translate into identifying your strengths and weaknesses? Um, it's an everyday process. Mm -hmm. I, I often find like, you know, every month I, I feel like I've grown more as a person than I did, you know, than I was a person a month ago. So it's kind of like, if you open yourself up to the opportunity to learn and explore more in yourself, then that just better, that betters yourself as well as your environment and people that you associate with. So if you continually identify strengths in yourself and applaud those, but then also be fair to yourself and identify your weaknesses, you can go far. This new generation of middle-class blacks has created a model for success. The model centers on four key success factors, education, parental involvement, faith, and personal responsibility. Instilling the best of these four factors in children produces well-rounded, productive, and successful adults.